We're on. Cool. Hello. Hello. All right. Hello, I everyone. See Hello, we, the world. We have one of my students in here, Darren. Hi, Darren. Hey, Hi, Darren. Darren. Nice to meet you. Oh, Shane, we've got a little thing on the stream. Hey, it looks like that? it's, uh, do you see it on the I Twitch? Fixed it. It's already fixed. Okay, cool. cool. On top of That's it. very efficient. <laughs> wow. Well, right, guys. Now, now I get to watch it in real time. <laughs> <laughs> so, first one. Sort of. Did the is, test the other day, but this is the first one. Is there Very anybody on one. Yeah. Is there anybody Wait. on YouTube? I'm just seeing. If know. anybody's on YouTube, please comment so we know you're there. Yeah, everyone, please feel free to to give us questions and stuff to talk about. Today we are we thought we'd kind of generally introduce ourselves and talk about, you know, what got us into writing music for film and, and things like that. And um, yeah, we tend to not have trouble talking about films, so we should be able to fill an hour fairly straightforwardly, don't you think, guys? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. <laughs> yeah, so, I think, um, well, go, go ahead. Yeah, whatever. I was, just, I was going to say, like, shall we say, shall we kind of start with um, a little bit about because we were talking the other day actually about um, how some of us started off performing and Others of us just kind of fell into it a bit more uh, of composing. Should we maybe start talking about that and how? Well, I think real briefly, like, okay, we're all friends, you know, just like sort of who we are. Why Why are the six of us talking to each other? Most of the um, time. Yeah. And <laughs> so the most of us um, did our course at Royal College of Music together. And it's sort of where we all met, uh, did our master's in film music. Um, and then... Vincenzo sort of joined a few years behind, and we met uh, Michael elsewhere in the world and uh, on the mean streets of London. Uh, <laughs> the mean the bleak pull, one, pulled him into our, our group. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of like, and I, I guess the only reason I'm addressing it is because since we've been friends and we've worked together for so long, we've been on so many projects together, and we've, uh, you know, kind of been in the trenches together. And so it's like, I see this whole platform as a forum to be able to kind of share those experiences and things. So, and even that's, yeah, that's, sort of, that's why we're doing it. Even yeah. before we started working together, like on professional projects, we were working together on students projects and helping each other with a recording session or, oh, I need someone to help me orchestrate or print this or whatever. We were always helping one another out. So I think, yeah, we've had those oh, James is in too. Hey James. <laughs> yeah. We've yeah, had, yeah, a, those we've are... had a strong community building and, uh, it's a good thing. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So, yeah. So th that's, that's the message basically is that we wanted to do this because, you know, though we have kind of grown professionally with each other, we are aware how isolating it is anyway. You know, it's the running joke of lockdown that nothing's really changed for composers because they always work on their own in isolation anyway. But actually now that we had, now that we had a, an excuse not to see people and not to meet people, we could work even more. So it was even yeah, we've <laughs> we've actually achieved something, guys. We've started yeah, exactly. this live stream. <laughs> yeah. In uh, you know, we're all in it. Well, most of us are spread out now. V, v, you're in Italy. I'm in up north in northwest. I suppose the rest of you in London, aren't you? Yeah. But um, yeah, cool. Okay, well, let's yeah, talk Sam, about things. Yeah, what did I? I cut you off from something. I can't remember. Profound, I was, I'm sure. I was saying, <laughs> I was saying that um, we we touched on this the other day that how we got into this actually was a bit different. We all kind of ended up, I guess, learning um, composition in higher education, right? Or, or you know, some variants of that. And um, but to get into writing music was very different for us. Some of us started off performing in bands. Some of us in orchestras. Some of us not performing at all. And maybe that's something we can. Can I can I just say can I just say quickly hi to my friend Giovanni who's just joining in us and has asked us on YouTube how did we all meet and uh, how did we how we did start working together so this is exactly what we were about to uh, mm -hmm. start getting into Giovanni. Well, I guess yeah. uh, well okay let's let's answer that first because that's far more interesting. So <laughs> I say that. So as Mike kind of said, we um, it was me, Shane, and Mike and Ali were all in the same year doing a masters at the Royal College in London. So we got to know each other and became friends then. And as Shane said, we, as part of the course, we have we had to 
you know make things happen in the in the studio and stuff and we needed help from each other and i know on, on my part i was very aware that everyone in the year kind of had different skill sets and different you know abilities in 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 certain things and i was like well what can i offer so i started telling people let me orchestrate for you it gets me experience doing that and then so that's how i started helping people out is is when they whenever they were recording something i'd see if they wanted something orchestrating um yeah and but obviously it was that was that was more on a sort of um individual projects level but we also had to do it as part of the course right and mm. we were forced to work with each other then um producing sessions and stuff so i can't, I can't remember we were already all used to it at that time because I think we got quite lucky that in our year group we were really supportive with one another. Mm. And, yeah. um, you know, even by the time we had to work together as part of our, this is how you have someone produce your session. And this is, we're like, mate, we've already done it. You know, yeah, it was really, it was really recognized helpful. the value of doing it straight away and, and started supporting one another. Well, well, just on that as well, the, we were very fortunate, I think, in our year because, um, there, there's a lot of people want to do this <laughs> and it's very competitive and actually to join a year a year group where you know so for example a lot of the things uh, we had to do very often for college was we were sent out to various creative school like the Royal College of Art or a filmmaking school and we'd have to pitch our own music and that was very intimidating you know you're, you're having to play your music not just to a room full of strangers who may or may not want to work with you but also your 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 colleagues who who definitely are... don't want to hear the same pitch again <laughs> yeah. that you they've already heard you give at all the other film schools <laughs> yeah for like three hours you had to sit there yeah. there was but, always, you could always tell like some people would come up and just play the exact same piece of music that they had already played and then other people would play something new try yeah. like split testing like yeah <laughs> but the but the bit after that where You'd sort of stand in a in a circle with your composer friends and hope that one of these filmmakers might approach you and say, "Can I use your music, please?" You know, I remember there being occasions where, you know, you'd be approached by someone and they talk about their project and you'd think, "I'm not really right for this. You should speak to this guy. His his music's perfect for for your film." And it was much more of that kind of support network. And, and V, I, I mean, you were you did the same course. You were a couple of years below. Yeah. And, did you have a similar experience to us in that? I, I, I was going to say, um, I've heard that like it, it, it's it been very um, sort of different depending on the years. And uh, I feel lucky because in my year, I feel we were all quite um, uh, supportive of each other as well. We all um, uh, sort, of, sort of mingled quite, uh, quite quickly uh, when the year started. And, uh, you know... Obviously, there's always a little bit of uh, of competition, and you're all in the same business, and you know that like some people who are sitting there with you in your class may end up getting the job that you were hoping to get someday, uh, and and uh, and so that puts a degree of 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 competition with the other people. But um, the the cool thing is when you can also sort of say yes, there's that, but there's also the fact that we know each other as 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 people as individuals and we have a mutual respect and uh, and then friendships starts to uh start, starts to um you know be created and it's just like we we were able to basically have a very positive environment i feel in in our in our year and uh, uh we we still we are all still in touch we still have a a whatsapp group and uh, we started working together i've orchestrated some stuff for for some of my course mates i've had some of my course mates help me out uh on some of my projects so um i i feel definitely that the connection that our course uh can uh encourage you to build are are very important and 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 if you if you can sort of if you have the ability of bypassing or actually knowing that the competition is not the only thing that needs to be there i feel it's it's very useful very important very encouraging so yeah Yeah. well i'll I'll say on that too like i think the competition aspect of it really only exists in our own mind when we're students like that actually out of college all of that shit disappears like yeah. you, you know, I've probably had more work from composers than I have, you know, from uh, filmmakers, you know, kind of coming oh, yeah. in and uh, and it's building those, you know, relationships together that it's like, I always thought of it like, um, you know, even when we would go to these sort of terrible pitching sessions, 
where we'd be pitching the same thing, you know, to a group of filmmakers, it, it felt like speed dating in the worst way. And it's like, you know, because if you're getting a project that kind of like, I, I always thought of it a little like dating. It's like, you know, if both of us are into the same person and then they pick one person versus the other, like, it's not because you're a bad person. It's because it's not the right fit. You so, know? It all, so it all makes a lot of sense now, Mike. That that's, how you were, that's how you're approaching these pitching yeah. sessions. But also, Mike, you have a, a very effective technique of seducing directors, yeah. like yeah. luring them into like that, that's also very important. Like your seduction chops must be spot on. But I don't what, know. I'm I'm not Italian, so <laughs> yeah. are you not? You get you you're getting there. You're, yeah. getting, you're like level one. Yeah, yeah. you're er you're earning your passport, Mike. You're you're earning your passport. But B, while while we're on the subject, it's perhaps worth mentioning a little bit of background that we also know you because you lived with us before uh, your course started. So we got an extra dollop of Vincenzo for six months before uh, <laughs> yeah. before you start the course. Me. So we were we tried to sort of. It's, it feels condescending to say mentor you, but I feel like we were preparing you for your course a little bit. When we, oh, no, we're, guys. Like, we're all very excited to be like, oh, this is the things you need to look out for. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, I feel like having... having uh, so for people who don't know, I, 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 I'm not sure we've, we've already said this, but basically before I started the same course that uh, some of us did, like Mike, Sam, and Ale, and Shane, um, everyone except Michael, basically. Uh, <laughs> not, to, not, to, not to exclude you. Uh, no, but anyways, uh, before before I, I, I sort of went through that same experience, I was lucky enough to move to London and sort of like randomly end up living uh, and sharing a flat with Mike and Sam. Uh, and uh, little did I know back then that first of all, they we would become really good friends. And, and I think you guys are definitely some of the closest friends uh, and most meaningful relationship I've, I've built in London. Um, but also... Um, Honestly, sharing those six months with you guys was the best preparation I could have hoped for, both for like London life and for college life. And I feel was like it, was it completely random when you went and lived? It there? was random-ish. I, I think um, <laughs> not just because I, I don't know why. Though. No, I I really think so. If you if you have a goal and if you start m like walking towards that goal positive things are going to happen. I thoroughly believe this. And, and so you when... include these positive things. What I did was like, so when, when, when I knew that I was coming to London, I started harassing all of my friends. Like, please give me contacts with whoever you have based in London. I, 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 I'm going there and I, I was trying to prepare myself uh, for that. And like, by like, I think I just put a post on Facebook and some people started commenting and connecting yeah. me with people. And mm -hmm. a, a, a person that I sort of know from here, from my region in Italy, is it's a violinist player who worked in RCM for a couple of years as like a technician or something. But basically he put me in touch with Andrea Boccadoro, who is another uh, person who was in, in the same year of, as you guys. Um, and Andrea happened to be sort of uh, looking for somebody to uh, to uh, take his place in the apartment that we were in the flat we were sharing because uh, he needed to uh, go about with his life in I think it was going to Paris right yeah for, for a while time, yeah. and so basically it was just pure luck I met Andrea actually initially I met Andrea and I just texted him like hey can you give me some details about RCM and then he mentioned oh by the way I'm moving out do you want to move in and I was like sure and uh and then it was love at first sight, wasn't it? Right. Yeah, love at first sight. Yeah, so then how did we rope in the other American? Yeah. Uh, would you like uh, to hear my story now? So, <laughs> um, Would you prefer the abridged or the full? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> would you like... A rainy Wednesday afternoon, 1993. Um, <laughs> oh, now... Um, no, I, uh, you know, I moved to London five years ago um, and I came here to, you know, study bassoon. And when I first moved to London, um, I was introduced to Mike um, through one of Mike's childhood friends, Dylan, who I had known uh, when I was Which at Eastman. Um, Which Dylan? This is Dylan <laughs> Price. Well, Shout Dylan out to Dylan. Which one's um, the best Dylan? We haven't figured that out yet. We can't say that on air. Depends on who you <laughs> ask. <laughs> um, Depends on what Dylan is watching us. <laughs> um, so Dylan introduced me to Mike just because I, I distinctly remember him saying, 
you look exactly like my friend Mike because we were both wearing glasses at the same time. And, you know, so he immediately connected us on Skype and we all three chatted. And then I eventually connected with Mike sort of, I don't have my glasses anymore. I had LASIK, sorry. Um, yeah. <laughs> and um, so we connected, uh, I think the second year I was here because I was interested in getting the tier one visa, which is basically, it's the artist visa for the UK. It's a giant pain to get. And Mike talked me through the very complicated process. And um, then sort of things went quiet for, for a little while. Wasn't sure if he liked me. And uh, then uh, a couple years later, uh, we sort of reconnected again. And rekindled, uh, rekindled, our, <laughs> uh, rekindled our relationship. And uh, Mike brought me in on a big project that we all ended up working on. And then I was yeah. you know, brought into the fold. And uh, I'm very glad to be here. So. I should really be thanking Mike that I have any friends in London. So, <laughs> can I can I say one thing, guys? I just wanted to ask since we've been talking about like these connections, these, these like positive connections that we randomly made. My friend who's watching us from YouTube, Giovanni, he has moved recently to London. I think this is this has been his first year in London. Not a very lucky one because of all the pandemics and stuff. But anyway, I I he he was doing a a um, course, uh, a film. Actually, it's not just film music. I think his course is more on like general, in general composition for for media. Um, and I was wondering if he has experienced something similar because he's not uh, at RCM. I think he's at Trinity, if I remember correctly. Uh, or Guildhall, but I was just wondering if he has had a similar experience to the one we had in his college, where like people in the same course can build very uh, positive and and encouraging connections. Uh, and uh, and I was also wondering if uh, like when you moved to London, Giovanni, if uh, like how did it feel for you? So if you want to let us know about yeah, that, yeah, that'll be, that'll be I'll really up to you know anyone else in here too like i see darren and james um who've been uh on my streams quite a bit and i know um james is at academy and darren uh is at college too uh so anyone feel free to sort of chime in and um you know talk about kind of what you see or you know ask any questions and that sort of thing yeah i, I think it's, it's interesting to to hear that because you know um as you guys know i'm very biased against london so the, the idea of, of especially from abroad, perhaps it's not your first language and, and moving to somewhere that is not an easy place to live, uh, certainly not financially. Um, and that can, be, that can be so isolating to do that. And when you're then kind of focusing all your attention on a career that is also not easy um, for various reasons, then yeah, it's, it, I, you know, this is why we've been very fortunate I think, um, and I think this is also like trying to create something like this, like an uh, an environment of support and of uh, of this kind. It was also the, the reason why initially uh, you, Sam, and Mike and Andrea moved in together, like sort of yeah. trying to build a composer's stronghold. <laughs> yeah. Well, Mike, you'd you'd live sort of with with Andrea, hadn't you, in in the sort of student halls? Sort of, I mean, very much. Yeah, very <laughs> as in next door. <laughs> very much, sure, yeah. And so, we very uh, much lived in a very tiny student flat. <laughs> and I was jealous, so I wanted to create this menage a trois, <laughs> and um, this creative menage a trois, and then we moved into a slightly grothy house in Acton. Yeah. Um, Crash in, you know, as I've heard it affectionately <laughs> called. I think, guys, every, every, every all at some point, because now uh, Ale is living with Max, like we, we all more or less have been living with other composers, haven't we? Don't spoil the illusion. Ale is not yeah. next door to Mike right now. <laughs> no, 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 no. He, he's <laughs> in a different <laughs> part of the city. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, Vincenzo, I. Uh, I'm the one that has not lived with the composers. You know, I'm the one that's uh, made the smart decision. You, you've yeah. chosen Piccadilly Circus over <laughs> chosen composers. wisely. Yeah. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> well, Shane, um, like, because you've what what, uh, what were you doing, Shane? Like, because you've been with Kate for so long now, you must have uh, is that like five years now, six years? Yeah, Good yeah, that's right. Kate. So. Um, well, I mean, interesting that you mentioned how we've all kind of lived with each other, except for Michael, that you're <laughs> leaving him out. I mean, Mike was actually like the first one of the first people I met in London. He was my yeah. my Shane's my neighbor. first friend. In London. We were like first friends. And it's kind of, yeah, amazing that we've stuck together for this long and had each other's backs. Like, it's been really cool. Yeah. Um, and as for, yeah, now I've, yeah, I've been uh, living with Kate, which is really cool. 
Um, also a musician. Instrumentalist, also. yes. Violin Off screen. Player. Off screen. And <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's been really educational, uh, like recording her on things and asking her questions. Like she gets annoyed with me with when I run in and I'm like, wait, should the Boeing be like this or like this? And she's like, figure it out yourself. <laughs> You're always learning. I was just yeah. told today by my by by my colleague Jean, if you're listening, Jean, you're not listening because you're very busy on a project. Um, but um, he was saying, yeah, d dating a uh, a musician is the best way to be an orchestrator. Yeah. <laughs> you just got to date as many musicians as possible. <laughs> yeah, but this is this is exactly why I was asking the question. If we've all lived with other composers, and like I, I'm I'm uh, looking at the comment section on YouTube, and Giovanni is saying that like he found a very uh, supporting environments also at Trinity Lab and where he's studying and he is actually sharing a flat with another composer who happened to who happens to be an RCM composer Gianfranco uh, who yeah, actually I know, know Gianfranco yeah exactly he is yeah. in is in in RCM right now so yeah. I think this this thing of like living with other composers is com kind of a common trend and I was wondering if you guys feel that and uh, please whoever is watching feel free to join in and 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 let us know in the comments like if you feel this has actually not only helped your like your uh your do you say psyche in english your psyche yeah. like if mm -hmm. if, it, if it has helped you on your a psychological health. level yeah your mental health but also if you feel like this has been something useful and relevant for your career and uh, to sort of build up um a uh, strong working relationship and i kind of know the answer for for, for for most of the people in this group but i'm really wondering if like some somebody like Giovanni or anybody who has been living maybe in London for a shorter period already started noticing this because as I was saying before six months with you guys before starting college had already been incredibly beneficial for me I had already met a bunch of musicians from London and other creatives uh, in the music industry and in the arts industry in general in London so um like, how do you oh, think, think about think the benefits you, of this? I think when you live with another composer at this stage of our career it's like it's like if you're in constant therapy and uh, yeah. one is the psychologist of the other and one is always bitching to the other about something, the other is always bitching to the other one about something Dude, else. Dude, I'm right here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's kind of reciprocal. But, uh, that sounds familiar. Even, even if you don't yeah. spe if, sorry, Ali. No, no, go on, go on. I was going to say, even if you don't specifically live with them, I mean, just have, uh, giving them a call to, to ask yeah. about something, to talk about yeah. something, having yeah. those connections is maybe more important than sharing a kitchen with them or whatever. Depends <laughs> no, how you get along with them. Even if you just yeah. leave a comment on a live stream chat on a Wednesday night. That helps. Anything. That, that helps, absolutely. Oh, my God. <laughs> and Mike, Mike uh, Michael, sorry, how... Yes. Like, since you're the only one who hasn't been sort of living with each other or living in composer strongholds or similar things, what's your experience regarding this? Like, did you feel like you were missing out on something or um, didn't it really? Make actually, a so I've only lived two places in London. The first was the Guildhall student accommodation, um, which is an experience, you know, you need once and then you don't need to repeat it again. Um, <laughs> and um, so when I when I left, uh, I was initially planning on living with a friend from Guildhall, but uh, there was an issue housing wise. And so I sort of had to find a place on my own, not on my own, on my own, but with sort of random people. And, you know, it would be sort of nice to be surrounded by musicians. But at the same time, I actually really enjoy not having to constantly be surrounded by it. Like I can really distance myself from it. Um, and I'm not saying that even when we all meet up, we're talking about it all the time, but it's it's nice to sort of have the the physical uh, living distance space. Um, like we're all pretty much in this flat, we keep to ourselves. And um, that sort of gives me a good environment to work in. I think for me, at least personally, I, I really enjoy my alone time and time to really think about things without feeling the um the pressure um because while living with other composers or other musicians would be great there's sort of almost this additional pressure to show what you've been doing and you know to be pro proactive and i don't necessarily have to do that if i don't want to um i can just you know call you guys up and go hang out at your houses if i need that so um in, in my experience it's not been um sort of a detrimental thing i've actually I, I i've enjoyed that. it I get well, that. If, if, if you'll ever change your mind, Michael, they're probably building a fourth room in a, in my flat. I don't know if I told you guys, <laughs> they? They, they want to build the next room. So Look, change I your mind. Take, just I was going to take the couch. It's it's fine. Fine. Shove him in the attic. Uh, well, James has just commented on talking about um, at Academy, kind of just the composers having a great bond with each other and uh, sort of making projects and stuff together. 
And I think that's, I mean, it's interesting because of like um, when we did Infinite Bridge, uh, which was this theater show that um, in our second year at college, um, Sam and I with another one of our colleagues, Mari, um, had kind of put together this big theater show. And, uh, you know, and then Vincenzo, you did a similar thing um, yeah. that was also in the Britain Theater at the college. And it's, it's like that too. I think those are, you know, it stemmed from like, yeah, sure, all of us want these film projects, you know, this amazing student film project that doesn't exist. And, uh, you know, with loads of money and uh, a lot of respect. And um, so instead you create your own thing. And, you know, I've found like for me, Infinite Bridge was such a catalyst of like kind of jumping, jumpstarting my career after college. And it was because it was self-led, you know, it was a project that we made. And so I think too, like relying on your colleagues and working with the people around you, you know, like you already have so much talent, you're constantly pushing each other while you're in school, then you start to build those things and then you get recognized for it uh, afterwards. Yeah, yeah so I, I mean, think I, it's totally useful. I remember like, I've always said that the best thing we did at college was the, was the business plan in, in business module. Oh yeah. Because, no. because uh, you know, they, I mean, they were obviously much of the course was fantastic, but the thing about that was they, you, you had to sit down and think, what am I doing and how am I going to get from here to there in the next however many years? Because they're sort of, sim I, I don't know, I, speaking for myself, I suppose, but a symptom for me of, of wanting to do this, which was a sort of quick turnaround when I was 18, as you guys know, we'll get into that. Um, yeah was that oh, okay. as soon as I knew I was doing music, it was film music. And then I just had blinkers on, did everything I need to do, got into college, and that was like the first rung up. But then I hadn't really looked further ahead. I just thought I want to do certain things, but I had no idea how to get there. And actually the business plan got us sitting down and planning that. And that's really where I first thought about, um, you know, selling myself as an orchestrator yeah. um, because I thought that's something I could genuinely offer because I kind of could already do that a bit. I realise now I couldn't, but there we go. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, you start sort of telling people, you know, I can do this, you know, and you start doing it for, for, for your colleagues, not aiming um, for these projects that just don't exist yet. You've got to kind of earn your chops, I suppose. Um, but yeah, it's, it's interesting. I don't know if you guys had the same experience with your business plan, that this was, that was the thing that kind of, I yeah. don't know if you, oh, Michael, yeah. if you've had something where you've kind of had that, had that existential crisis in writing that you've had to yeah. like, figure it out. I feel like know? it's every social media message I've ever sent to anyone has that in writing. <laughs> I, I think that's a great segue, Dr. Jones, into kind of how you started to get into this. Yeah, Doctor Jones. I sorry, guys. I just I just thought of one thing. Uh, I I realized that um, my friend Alessandro uh, Carici, who's a fantastic guitarist from uh, from Italy, uh, he uh, he's watching us on YouTube, and uh, he doesn't live in London, and uh, he uh, has never lived in a share house with composers or um, musicians. And uh, I'm wondering, like, how if he wants to say something and to to comment on, like, what's the sort of like the different perspective? Because I I like to think that at some point we'll have people watching not only from from London but from some other places. So I'm wondering if Alessandro wants to tell us something about like how what's he, what's his experience and if he if he feels like uh, he would have gotten more for like from living in a bigger city with uh, other musicians and stuff like that, or if he feels that he's experienced living like in a smaller city and doing a sort of smaller um, uh, conservatory uh, has, has taken him towards other directions and stuff like that. Yeah. I think that's, for, I would certainly say for me, there's a, there's definitely an added pressure from being in London. You, you feel the pressure, I suppose, creatively, um, but also, you know, you've got to earn your keep <laughs> and it costs twice as well, more than yeah. twice as much as anywhere else and certainly in this country. Yeah. And so you, you do feel a bit more pressure. So I'd be interested yeah. to that. And tie, yeah. tie, tying in with what you were saying, Sam, uh, we have Annabelle Lee asking us on YouTube, how much, uh, do the music colleges, uh, set us up to be prepared for, uh, on a business level? So business wise for our industry, uh, which is sort of what we were discussing a, a minute well, ago, like the well, business I guess, plan program. 
it is a it, well, it isn't. It isn't what we're saying. <laughs> Mine is it. Um, it isn't. It isn't. I mean, I would say what I was getting at earlier was more of a, I don't know, um, um, a psychological thing. It was. It was. I mean, yeah. It was. Yeah. It was another crisis, but a useful one. No, but it was. It just got me thinking about it. I mean, obviously, you have to plan the the finances and stuff. But the the, the rest of the module was very good for for understanding the industry because we we dealt with you know contracts and budgets and things like that and that was yeah. that was very handy mm -hmm. but um yeah we were saying so are we, are we, mike shall we do this quick introduction then to, to, or yeah. not or what, what are we talking about are we doing the the businessy stuff or the how we got into it stuff well yeah kind of getting into it um you know a bit um i mean i guess like, you know, well, that was sort of the topic we wanted to dis discuss, which is yeah. really an open-ended thing. So, you know, I mean, we're not doing this thing super scripted, you know, on purpose, uh, because it's mostly like a platform of like talking points. Mm -hmm. So if anybody wants to kind of chime in and ask questions along the way. Uh, but so today we just thought a sort of general topic is how each of us broke in, but really with the aim of like, that everybody comes into this differently. You know, I think that especially film music, which is different than maybe like a more um, typical classical music uh, sort of, you know, projected pathway. Film music, everybody sort of finds their way to it in a slightly different way, um, mm -hmm. you know, and each of us has our own kind of way in. Um, so I think it'll be interesting. We can kind of talk about that. And then if anyone else has anything they want to sort of share or, you know, also in a way to maybe help other people who think maybe that uh, if you think there's a sort of expected path or that you feel maybe I'm not on the right path or I haven't done the right things, you know, to kind of debunk that a little bit because there, there really isn't a, a direct way into it. I think it's important to keep in mind that, you know, um, you know, the idea of having a film music course has only been around for, you know, like the last decades. decade, 15, 20 years at most. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, there's obviously no right or wrong way to get into it. Yeah. Um, and I think that'll become very apparent, um, you know, once we all start telling our individual well, stories. Uh, there's a reason for that as well. It's because it's becoming incredibly popular. I mean, it's always been sort of, it, it's in the last sort of, the, well, I don't know how many years, but it's always been deemed pretty glamorous, I suppose, in the music world that it's this, you know, yeah, it's, it's this something that's remained very popular. But uh, in the last 20 years or so, it's something that there's an awful lot of people that want to do it. I think particularly after 2000, um, once yeah. we sort of got into the Zimmer era, there's a lot of people that had really picked up on it. It became yeah, a lot sure. more popular. Zimmer era? Rain Man, 89. <laughs> anyway. I'm talking about modern so, Zimmer here. Cool. Yeah. So who wants to kick us off? Uh, do we want to go in order on the chat? So starting with Ale in the upper left-hand yeah, corner. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. yeah. Are we got into it? Yeah. yeah. Um, I was playing um, guitar with bands like for in my teenage years and then when i finished high school i just wanted to to study an instrument i didn't care which one to be honest so i just i i liked the clarinet and i started playing clarinet yeah and uh, i studied um uh, my uh, conservatory degree in italy and it lasted seven years uh, it was a short one and um, and then, well, I moved to London because uh, basically I followed my uh, ex-girlfriend. I didn't even uh, come here. And uh, so she wanted to come here, uh, really. And so I thought, okay, I have a degree in clarinet. What am I going to do in this little town uh, in the middle of Italy? It's not going to work. So it's probably best if I go to London. And I find myself something to do, and I, uh, looking through the internet, I, I thought, well, I love uh, films, I love music, maybe I could uh, do both. And so I found the, the course at the RCM, I applied, got into it, met you guys, and um, it was amazing. It was just, I learned everything at college, I didn't know anything before before my first year at college. Uh, the first music I wrote for orchestra uh, was the music I wrote for the 
uh, for the submission at college. That was the first time I wrote anything. Uh, Prodigy. Catchy. Well, I mean, I stayed on, on that level, though. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but um, going to college with you guys was, I mean, it wasn't wasn't only like supportive, it was amazing. I, I, I grew so much like in my in my craft because uh, do you remember when uh, we mm, used to like bring our own music to the practical skills and I was so scared that I had to basically submit my music to all of you guys who were all amazing uh, people like 10 years younger than me uh, coming from Australia, Kevin. <laughs> Oh, Kevin, <laughs> he was so yeah. annoyingly good. <laughs> that was amazing. Kevin Pankin. Was, yeah. yeah. Um, no, that was that was great. It helped a lot. And yeah, that's me. Cool. Michael. Oh, all right. So um, I got into music um, in high school. Or, well, I shouldn't say that. I got into music in middle school when I started picking up the trumpet. You know, I'd always grown up around music, but it was more classic rock. My dad was really into that, but neither of my parents really played instruments past high school. Um, so I picked up my dad's trumpet in middle school and eventually sort of got bored with that and thought, you know, I'm gonna pick up a very easy instrument and you know, ones that will uh, make the ladies swoon. So I, I chose the bassoon. Um, <laughs> and uh, so I, I picked it up pretty late in high school um, during uh, my junior year and then uh, just picked it up really quickly and then decided, you know, I wanted to do music. I knew I wanted to do music, but um, wasn't sure on what instrument. So just went with the bassoon and ended up at Eastman where I met uh, Dylan, Mike's friend, who then eventually introduced us. Um, but when it comes to sort of uh, composition, you know, I, I didn't actually start composing until I moved to London five years ago. Um, and actually, I don't think any of you guys know this, but um, so Masquerado is a, a musical I, I just wrote and recorded at Abbey Road. It's about to be released, which I'm really excited about. Masquerado was actually the first piece I ever wrote, um, which is... Who's the prodigy now? We heard the mix. The, 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 well, the, the nice thing is that the... Um, it was such a long, you know, yeah, amount of music yeah, that I was able to sort of develop a style throughout and then I could go back and change things if I didn't like it. Um, but what I what sort of allowed me to do that is that, you know, when I was at Eastman, uh, so with Dylan Price, um, Dylan had started uh, a film music ensemble at Eastman. So it was student run. And through that, I started doing a lot of arrangements. The I'd always Eastman done some film music ensemble. Yes. A.K.A. Well, tech. <laughs> Empire Film Music Ensemble. Now it's Empire Film and Media Ensemble. So now it's not F me anymore. <laughs> uh, not quite on the nose. And um, so I had always sort of done arrangements. Um, and when I was at Eastman, I tried to do a lot more complex arrangements sort of for full orchestra. And the nice thing about playing the bassoon as well as sort of any woodwind instrument is you're sort of sat in the middle of, every of everything. So years and years of me just sort of absorbing what had gone on around me proved to be a really sort of great orchestration um, education. I mean, as long as you're paying attention to it and trying to realize why things work the way they do. Um, and so, yeah, um, my first year at Guildhall, I was just, I needed a creative outlet outside of playing because, um, you know, I love playing the bassoon, but I mean, um, I was tired of playing, you know, Beethoven five, you know, nine, 10 times. And I wanted to sort of do something fresh and new. And so I thought, you know, why not try to channel creative energies into writing? And so that's where um, Masquerado came into play because I could determine my own story and, you know, sort of be my own boss as opposed to uh, having to follow, you know, director's instructions or anything like that. And it allowed me to really flesh out um, compositionally what I could do and sort of stretch my wings. Um, and it, it was a great experience. And then eventually led me to, you know, working with you guys, which is, the, the true dream. So, wretch. I can't believe that's your first piece. That makes me sick. <laughs> <laughs> Background of that is we had the privilege of listening to these recordings of this piece, and we all came out pretty intimidated and blown away by the quality of the and orchestral annoyed. writing and annoyed. Yeah. yeah, and he's a little bit less of a friend as a result. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh -huh. Well, yeah, I guess I'll give you the sort of cliff notes. It all started at a male beauty pageant. Um, but <laughs> when I was... That's all good things do. 
uh, deeply inspired by the music of John Williams. Um, it was, well, I was sort of like, you know, played in a bunch of uh, rock bands and things like that and just played guitar. Like I, I hadn't studied music really formally until I was probably 16 or 17 um, when I took music theory classes in high school. And that's when I actually learned how to read music. Um, but I had our friend Dylan, who's getting a lot of airtime today. Um, <laughs> yeah. Dylan was if like, he's not watching, I'll be so upset. I know. <laughs> and he's not paying us at all. So like, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Dylan, um, you know, was, uh, I mean, he's one of my closest friends that I've known since the first grade. And, uh, you know, we both happened to grow up and become film composers. And so it was sort of like, we, we're, it was the only we were each other's only other person that we could share this with or who like understood and so we did loads of um film music workshops and that sort of stuff like summer workshops together where uh we had done this one at nyu and uh you know and then we did another one in seattle and we had first like audited at nyu and then came back a couple years when we got accepted into it and in all these things like happened to get accepted in the same year as well it was like amazing that we could you know, kind of do that together. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it kind of grew out of just like wanting to do something in music and not really knowing what that role could be because not really having an understanding of what existed as a job in the music industry um, at that time growing up in upstate New York. And uh, so then it kind of hit me like, okay, film music is a sort of way to go. And I knew it was I knew I wanted to write and I knew it was going to be something that was more commercial. Um, and then I eventually, after I went to Ithaca College for a couple of years, I transferred to Purchase. And that was like a real singer songwriter program in college in my undergrad. Um, and that's where we did these sorts of appraisals, you know, like studio um, kind of workshops once a week. So I was super used to uh, like sharing your music in front of all of your peers every week and it was just like okay go you know uh put up your best stuff and then everybody just rips it apart for 15 minutes mm -hmm. and um so yeah then i don't know i think through like college for me was something from like you know my first days of undergrad i was always dreaming of getting into usc and i'm gonna kind of like tie in a couple of like james and darren's questions a little bit into this um but that like I had thought, okay, I wanna go to USC's master's program writing for film. And it was like my dream for four years, I was pretty much working towards getting into that master's. And then kind of towards the end of it, I had met someone at uh, the NYU program who had told me about this course at the RCM. Um, and you know, I started looking into it. And so then I thought, okay, both of these I'm really interested in. And then eventually I got into both, but by that time it was kind of like, you know, I had thought that moving away, it was like, if I don't do this now, I'm never going to, I'll just move out to LA and I'll just be one of those people who works in LA, you know, from here on out. Because once I moved there and I start working, I knew like, I'm never gonna leave. That if that was sort of like the end goal for most people. Um, so I'm really glad I came to London because, you know, I also thought, well, there was so many, um, so much film music is recorded here that there's also going to be like a community and a kind of like periphery of roles and jobs that you can get into that's not just writing film music, um, which the same is true in LA. There's loads of assisting work and that sort of stuff um, that there's more of that that you can find than in London. But um, I think what's going on here, you know, is sort of, I had a kind of feeling at the time and it's sort of become, you know, I've seen it be true that I think there's more interesting things happening here maybe that like, because we get a kind of broader mix of different, like you get European film and it's sort of London is like the connecting joint between that and big Hollywood stuff. So you get a lot more kind of like artistic projects. Um, and uh, so I don't know, I, I find that really interesting. And then I think, you know, kind of out of RCM, obviously I'm massively biased towards the course. Um, it was amazing and I'm still a part of it, but it's, um, you know, then I think like the, the difference I noticed from undergrad to the masters was really in kind of something that, um, Annabelle asked about earlier of like the, I felt like when I left undergrad, I was ready to work. Like I was sort of creatively 
you know, um, kind of complete in what I wanted to do. Like I, I had a good idea of what I wanted to make, but then the masters was like, now you know how to actually run a business. It was sort of like, I could have just gone out of, you know, purchase and just moved to Brooklyn. Like most people that were in my class and just kind of gotten to work. But I, I think RCM really taught me like how to be a professional and, um, you know, and then out of that sort of, um, like first jobs and that sort of stuff that kind of got me into, you know, kind of where we are was I, I was doing a lot of assisting as a sort of like, I was like a freelance second call assistant to a lot of different composers for a while where I would be called like, you know, to work with Patrick Doyle for three days on a project and then be called for, you know, another uh, one of Aradell's composers or something to print stems for two days. And so it was kind of like, you know, most of them had a full time person. And then I was only pulled in like when shit was hitting the fan and when it was like a really big project. As, so as I, it does tend to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it was nice because I kind of got a lot of experience of like the, you know, the sort of like high intensity stuff um, and, you know, learned a lot from that. And you got to see so many different people's kind of um, uh, systems and kind of what worked and what really didn't work with it. Um, and, you know, kind of get to make your own. Um, and, you know, so I took like, just sort of looking at James' question, I, I think I got a lot kind of out of those. Um, and, you know, all of that is definitely a huge learning experience. And then just addressing Darren's, um, you know, kind of what pros and cons of sort of studying in London, I think, you know, touched on that a little bit of like, I think it's such a creative kind of place. And also that in London, you get music in everything. Like in New York, you get Broadway, but you don't really have much happening in film and TV in LA, you know, it's mostly film and TV. You don't really have theater or many orchestras, you know, New York also has like lots of ballet and opera and that sort of stuff. And London has everything like there's, you know, half a dozen full-time opera companies and, you know, dozens of orchestras and all that. So, so I think like, you know, I've thought about it a lot since in kind of like, what city do you want to study in? And I think that being in a really creative environment like London or, you know, I'm sure Paris or Berlin or something like that, too, could also be, uh, I mean, or New York still. But, you know, like, where is it going to support you to be able to, like, expose yourself to all of these different, um, you know, kind of creative, uh, you know, works and, and just shows and things like that? and kind of drive you to, you know, uh, let you kind of build into your own style. I think that's, so a, fair point. that's a fair point, actually, yeah. that, that, you know, you need to know what these cities are best at. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it used to be 10, 10 years ago, even, you know, I, I remember reading a, a book, uh, the one I always <laughs> reference to you guys, the Sean McMahon book on the tips for Hollywood scoring. And, yeah. um, that he's kind of self-published about 10 years ago, I think. And the first question in this book was, do you need to be in LA? And his answer was yes. And I remember reading that and my and my heart just sank because I didn't want to go there. I had no interest in going to LA. But in that time, I think for sure, I mean, London's always been a presence, obviously, but I think this is probably something we'll talk about in another, in another yeah. chat, but that yeah. idea of is Hollywood all that anymore? And we'll, I, I, you know. I, I was gonna I was gonna say uh, tying into all that you've been saying, Sam and Mike, uh, Darren. We are definitely we're actually planning uh, a whole conversation on on this, uh, both on like how we feel the industry is changing, which is what Sam was saying, was saying, and also to if like Hollywood is still something you need to aspire to. And there's a lot to say on both these things, and I think we're planning to have down the line in the coming weeks. A conversation which focuses on on, on these things. So there, there there will be more to come because there's definitely much yeah. to say on yeah. both these. Topics. It's it's great questions, and that's you know like um, I think it's helpful too just to kind of see like we understand what our fears were coming out of college uh, so, six or seven years ago, <laughs> you know. But then I think things like it's constantly evolving, so that could be different, you know. And everybody sort of got their own um, experience. Yeah, yeah. Doctor Jones. Friend. 
my turn. <laughs> I'm not an actual doctor. I don't know. I don't like that. You are. Oh no, you are. Speaking oh, of doc speaking of doctor though, that is kind of what Mike's probably getting at. Is yeah. that uh, <laughs> how I got it? Um, yeah, bullet points. Bullet points. So I went to my school's instrument day, where they brought in a load of musical instruments. And there was a double bass next to a clarinet, and I couldn't. I said I can't be asked carrying the carrying the double bass, so I chose the clarinet. And that was when I was seven. It's usually um, tall people that play double bass. Well, you know, I'm six three. I should be all right, but I, I was too lazy. This is why you um, didn't play that, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> so I I was playing clarinet basically. That was my musical, the sum of my musical education until I was doing it for GCC and stuff. But all through my teenagers, I, I wanted to be a doctor. Um, both my parents are doctors, um, and I say that you know I, I wanted I wanted what being a doctor meant, and I just wasn't willing to put the work in apparently. So after I don't know how many years, I got to did all the right subjects. I did music plus three sciences at A level because I was trying to kid myself, I suppose. Um, and yeah, got to results day. Didn't didn't have any offers and didn't quite get the results. Agonizingly so, didn't quite get the results I needed for an automatic offer. So I was after an emotional half hour with my head of sixth form, who said, "Why aren't you doing music?" Um, I reluctantly uh, submitted an offer through clearing to go to Sheffield, which, as it happens, is very at the time certainly was very good and still is uh, for music. And he said, the, the head of admissions at Sheffield said, why, why aren't you doing medicine? Because it looked like I should have been doing medicine. Um, I said, I, I didn't get in. And he was like, well, we'll, we'll have He you. said that before or after your audition? <laughs> I, didn't, you know, I, didn't need, mate, I didn't need an audition. They were like, come here, we'll have you. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so, um, yeah, and three, three of the best years of my life at Sheffield. It was fabulous. Um, I would say... As soon as I knew I was doing music, there was only one thing I wanted to do because, you know, I, I sort of had in my head that professionally speaking, I wanted to be a doctor, but my obsession was films. I wouldn't say music as much as just going to the cinema with my friends. And uh, Mike, it's interesting that, that, you know, you've got a friend that kind of you both uh, all your entire lives have ended up doing the same thing. I just been, you know, my best mate Alex, uh, just been best man at his wedding, and we've always said he 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 went the writing, directing route, and producing route, and stuff like that. And he said, you know, we'll just help each other out. And now he's got a successful business at Rusty Quill, um, and yeah, so. It's, it's really weird that which we've, you've done a lot of music for, which I've done a lot of music for, yeah. And, um, and you know, we're in our 30s, it's so weird to think back 20 years, anyway. Um, so yeah, got to Sheffield, and you know, I, I wasn't, I was honing my modules entirely around a combination of interest, but also just, just doing film music. I mean, there it was so that's really. I've been composing for my GCSE and A level, and um, you know, I got into using Sibelius got nerdy about that before I was at um, university and then when at, when at uni there was nothing really at all tailored to film stuff so it was all a classic it was classical training basically and very much an emphasis on modern originality which was great but it didn't enthuse me as much as other subjects as you know so in some ways it was disappointing but without that time uh, you know, I had the time to to learn orchestration and stuff like that, and so I loved it so much at Sheffield. I stayed on to do a masters uh, where I did uh, splits of clarinet and composition, um, and yeah. So for the, and that was a portfolio and a recital. And for that recital, this is the weird thing: is for the recital, I part of the course was I got to have special lessons with a really, really good teacher for clarinet, and I went and I travelled to London to the RCM and had lessons with a teacher called Janet Hilton, who at the time I think was still or possibly just not head of woodwind. And obviously, you know, she was teaching me. I got talking to her about what I actually wanted to do, which wasn't clarinet. And um, she said, well, you know, we've got this course here. I don't know how many people they accept, but you should, you should apply. And I did, and I didn't get in. And then 
um, at the end. <laughs> and then, then I applied again. And that was actually quite valuable because it meant I, um, I knew what to do better. I, I didn't really know how to apply the first time. I didn't know what they were looking for, really. I just kind of, you know, I sent a load of the scores because I felt that was my strength, but I, I knew nothing about sequencing. I say that we did a very small amount at Sheffield, but didn't have any DAW stuff. Um, so, yeah, my the, the mock-ups we had to do were, were fairly atrocious. And, um, yeah, but then, and also the interview as well <laughs> with Vasco and Howard at the time. They had a good cop, bad cop routine, which they then switched the second year. So I, I was wise to that. Um, but yeah, so uh, and and then I was I di I didn't get in straight away on the second go. I was on um, uh, on the the sort of the sub list, whatever you call it. And it got to Easter, and I was like, I'm, I was teaching by this point. I had a lot of pupils that you know needed to know if I was coming back the following year. So I sent an email. I got a reply from head of the department saying we we don't rank our um, reserves. We we just reassess everyone. So I thought, oh, here we go. Three days later, they accepted me. So I still maintain to this day, had I not emailed to ask if I was in, they wouldn't have accepted me. And that's a life lesson, kids. There you go. <laughs> you push it, push it. And then I suppose, uh, I mean, you were mentioning some sort of uh, professional stuff. Just kind of linking to the question you were answering, Mike, um, of you know how of the value of the course uh, there's no way i'd be anywhere near what i'm doing now without it i mean uh, and those are for a couple of very direct reasons um as a result of promoting the orchestration stuff um for some reason um professors there or at least enrico who was my tutor lovely enrico um she saw responsibility in me and decided to uh, recommend me to her friend Maurizio, who had just got the Call the Midwife gig. Um, and so I started assisting him. Uh, that was a steep learning curve, but that, that was great. And within the same month, so um, yeah, I uh, just, just tangentially, one of the best things about the course is the people that they get to speak, the, the working often very famous um, professionals that they got to speak to us about their experiences. And one of those people was Michael Price of um, Sherlock and other things fame. And um, he mentioned his orchestrator, Anthony Whedon, who I immediately emailed and uh, loveliest man in the world. And but after six months, he got back to me and said, really sorry, just got gone through my emails. Um, send me some scores, sent him some scores. Another six months later, he, um, he emailed back and said, will you assist me on Sicario? Um, so like it took a year, but it's because I emailed him and, you know, it, I got very, very fortunate. And that was both of those were in the space of a month and they were while I was still at college. So I was very, very fortunate to have got those. Um, but without those sort of visit, those opportunities, I, I have no idea how I would, you know, have, have approached these people in the same way, you know, to, to be able to say, you know, your boss came to speak to us. Will you meet with me for coffee? And, you know, it's a very different thing. But anyway, so that's that's it in a very large nutshell for me. Go on, Shall Shane. I go on? <laughs> okay. Go on. Um, for me? Just started from a young age with a love of music. I uh, started playing drums when I was like six or seven, just bashing around, playing along to like Nirvana and stuff like that. My brother plays guitar um, and, you know, we were kind of, we grew up together as musicians and I would always play along with him and he would play along with me and we would play in bands together. And that was kind of how I got started. And, and I didn't even think about film music. I didn't think about orchestra it was all just, I just love listening to music. And eventually I was like, actually, I, I really love music. I want to understand it more. And as I started to understand it a bit more, um, I wanted to start writing little, so I started learning the guitar just for the fun. And I started writing little songs and not really knowing what I was doing, just teaching myself. And uh, I recognized that I really, really enjoyed it. And that the more I knew, the more enjoyment I could get out of it. So, you know, then I started learning music at high school and and just focusing on composition and, and trying to explore lots of different things. So I started like 
making music and little computer programs like FL Studio and Ableton Live and stuff, just trying whatever I could do to see how can I just make more music and enjoy it more. Um, and I tried lots of making lots of different styles of music. And I think like that, that like drum and bass and, and house music and stuff like that. Because again, that was another type of music that I loved. I just loved it all. And um, as I as I went through with that, I started realizing like, oh, there's kind of one direction this is pointing me because like I'm not necessarily like the greatest songwriter. I'm not necessarily the greatest house music producer or anything like these. Even though I enjoy all of those things, I felt like if I'm just knowledgeable about lots of different types of music, the person to be then is a media composer, composing music for films, TV, video games. If I just want to write music, that's the way to do it. Um, and so I studied music at university and I felt very much like a fish out of water there because everyone else was either a performer or if they were a composer, they were doing contemporary classical music. And I was like, yeah, that's great. It's really interesting to me, but like, that's not really what I'm here for. But none of the professors, none of the other students really got what I was about. And uh, so I, I managed to meet up with another composer. This was in Belfast in Northern Ireland, who... Um, he had been working as a professional composer in Belfast doing stuff for um, theater and stuff like that. Oh, and yeah, during my undergrad, a very important experience was uh, a friend of mine uh, put on a series of, of plays. At the, he was a, a drama student, so he directed some plays and he wanted live music to be involved. So I just started writing music for these plays, not really knowing what I was doing and got some of my friends from college to play live along with them. And then, you know, one of them went to like a drama festival. And then they, I think the, the the jury at the festival wanted to give me best music, but there was no such award. So I was awarded best sound design for the music that I wrote. Uh, so fair enough, I'll take it. Um, and then uh, because I enjoyed that so much, I, I went and spoke to this, this composer who'd been working professionally in Belfast. And he was like, look, if you want to do this seriously go to London, go to Royal College of Music, or I think he said, or NFTS or something like that. Anyway, I applied to the RCM. And Sam, I have to tell you, I was also on the reserve list. And they, uh, I didn't harass them. I waited for them to tell me and they did tell me. So I think even if you hadn't emailed them, they would have told you. Um, well, but, that's nice. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just, just out of interest. It was funny. Um, so when I got to RCM, obviously, as we've all said, it was incredible. I learned so much so quickly. Like I realized all the things I didn't know and and just voraciously tried to read and learn and score study. And I mean, yeah, there's obviously still so much I don't know. I just love learning about all this stuff all the time. Um, and so I had a great time at RCM. And then I, I did some assisting after that. That was the first, um, our friend Kevin Penkin, who we've already um, mentioned before, um, had had made friends with this guy, Daniel James, and he he was looking for an assistant at the time and I just started helping out doing bits and bobs and that was kind of the first mm. way I started working on some movies in some small capacity. I didn't really know what I was doing, but um, that was a re it turned out to be a really useful experience. And um, yeah, that was it. I, I just think RCM was such a great opportunity f for me because coming from studying in Belfast where kind of I didn't know anybody who knew what I wanted to do or was doing what I wanted to do and I couldn't really connect on that level with anyone. Um, coming to RCM where I was just surrounded by every, everyone knows it and I can just ask them questions and I can learn from them and I can bounce ideas off of them and yeah I felt like I was in the right place yeah hey. my go right that's Leo go um, well I I can actually tie in with uh, something that I think James was asking before um, for some reason, my uh, my chrono chronology of the chat on Twitch just got erased, so I can't really see his previous question. But I, I think somebody asked us how we got into how we got our first professional engagements and, and gigs. And actually, the, the way I got into into this um, is sort of by accident. As in, I um, I was studying. Uh, I've been studying piano my whole life, basically, and all through high school. And then um, I sort of quit uh conservatory uh the year that i was going to university thinking that i would try to pursue a uh conservatory i'm um, sorry a university career um and i really wasn't happy not doing music uh but while i was in university um i was doing a course which was kind of like 
based on multimedia stuff. There was a bit of video editing, a bit of audio editing and stuff like that. And in the video uh, course, basically, we were supposed to do a project um, uh, at the end of the course where we would shoot something and then edit it and sort of do either a short movie or a, I don't know, a corporate video or something. Uh, it was really open and free. But basically, um, a friend uh, and a college uh, university um, mate asked me, hey, you are like one of the few people that I know here who does music. Why don't you write something for my project? And I was like, okay. And uh, I had back then a motif, which is a very cool keyboard. Um, Stevie Wonder uses it often uh, live. And so basically, without knowing anything about media and logic and all that stuff, I, I had been playing in bands all, all my teenage life because I was, you know, playing piano and obviously into rock and roll and all that stuff. So I knew how what, what logic was just because I had been into recording studios a lot and a lot of, I had seen logic being used. So I had a Mac, I got logic, and I recorded everything with audio, with the sort of crappy sounds of the <laughs> keyboard. Um, and it was my first gig, basically. Um, and uh, this person uh, that asked me to write music without knowing, I, I was still basically a pianist. It was like literally one of the first things that I had composed besides songs that I had arranged and composed for these various bands. But like I was saying, this person who asked me to do this is one of my best friends today. And he's the director I've got on to work with a lot. He's like my most frequent collaborator. He's called Andrea Martelli. He's now based in Rome. Uh, we've done countless projects. He started a, a production company and I became the official composer for that. So like, it was literally by accident. Like I took it as a sort of joke. Oh yes, let's write music for a film. Uh, but then I, I realized, man, I really love this because it was like bringing together all my passions. I was into music. I was, I loved classical music and orchestral music. Uh, I uh, loved cinema. Uh, I had been writing songs and doing arrangements for the longest time with bands and stuff like that. Um, so I started thinking I should really do this more often. And as my life was going on, I sort of like decided to quit university, go back into conservatory and finish my piano degree. I, I did a bachelor in uh, jazz piano. Uh, but like film scoring was sort of always a, in the back of my mind. And I would I kept collaborating with this uh, person, Andrea, and with other directors because the word obviously spread. And basically, by the time I finished my bachelor, I had this, like already decided to completely switch to uh, film music. Um, because I just enjoyed it so much, uh, much more than piano, which I had been doing uh, my whole life up to that point. Um, and uh, and so this is how I ended up doing this. Uh, and then, as we were saying, I, I came to London, lived with a couple of you guys, went to college, and and that's how the story goes. So it's all very different, basically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. It's all totally yeah. different. And but I, I think, you know, like if, if there's something that I'm trying to say with all this, um, is that sort of trying to reply to what James, if I remember correctly, was saying. Uh, gigs and engagements may come out of the most unexpected places. And uh, tying in with what I was saying before, if you have a goal and you start walking towards that, things are going to happen to you and, like, the universe is going to move accordingly. I, The minute I started being open to write film for, uh, sorry, music for film or uh, documentaries and whatever, I people started asking me just because, you know, they needed and I could, uh, I needed, they needed that and I could do that. And, and then my life completely took an unexpected uh, direction. So, um, I mean, there's, I, I think we may even do a talk on how to get started in the film music business and how to get gigs and blah, blah, blah. But the bottom line is besides the, the you know, technical things and net, networking and festivals and blah, blah, blah. But there's a, there's a sort of, um, important thing which is really being open to things and talking to people and and putting yourself out there uh, and things will move accordingly and I, I think there's a fine line between that which i totally agree with um and then also like just doing everything which is something that i think especially when you're kind of in or fresh out of college you think like we need to, you know, I need to take on every gig and you need to say yes to everything. And, you know, it's like, that's kind of, I think, old bad advice. 
where it should really be more like you should say yes to the to everything that progresses you like you know take every opportunity that can push you forward so that doesn't mean just like score a bunch of stuff for free and that's going nowhere and do a bunch of people's favors that will never you know be reciprocated and i think that's um you know it's it's kind of a fine line because i think like what you're talking about i absolutely believe you know when you start talking about the things that you're interested in then it's you start to attract those things to you because people are then they kind of get they know you for that and they know that that's what you're interested in um but then you know i've i've had uh some really good advice from a common colleague of us that was saying you know like uh he was asking me this was years ago and he was like you know, how many IMDb credits do you have? And at the time I was like, oh, I think I have, you know, maybe 16. And he's like, well, I have eight and I have, uh, you know, a, an Emmy nomination. So <laughs> it was like, you know, things that matter. <laughs> um, obviously, you know, you take it with a grain of salt and kind of, you know, it's, it's not, uh, it's hard. You need to figure out what that means for yourself. But I, I think it was just something that when we were, you know, in college, it felt like that was, uh, and I think especially the American kind of, you know, attitude towards this is like, you know, you need to be the hardest working person in the room. If you're not working, somebody else is. And it's constantly like push, push, push yourself. And it's really like not the smartest thing. You know, it, it's about figuring out like how do you work the most efficiently towards your goals? and find the things that support you. Well, I think that's, uh, knowing that um, also keeps the bitterness from, you know, you know, infesting you because it's, it's really easy, I think, to think of, you know, composing as sort of a zero sum game that, you know, somebody gets the job and if you get the job, then it's my loss because um, there's not, a stuff, a not enough stuff to go around, but actually just focusing on the things that will benefit you personally in the long run is far more important than trying to, you know, have an incredibly full diary um, with, you know, back to back gigs, um, especially, you know, if the volume of work is the most important thing to you, because it's not developing you as a person, it's not developing you necessarily as a composer. And um, I think it causes a lot of unnecessary stress to think that way as well. No. And that's, that's definitely to be avoided in this because there's enough stress anyway. It's so, yeah, well, quite. I mean, it's so easy to impose stress upon yourself when it doesn't actually need to be there. And actually simple things like trying to work normal hours, if at all possible, is a good one, I find, um, which isn't always possible. But, you know, things like that to just try and find some kind of normality and comfort in doing this because it sh you shouldn't be doing this for the opportunity to work nights <laughs> and you know what i mean it, it should be the, do do what makes you happy within this and that should be enough to to do it don't sort of look around you and um yeah just judge yourself by how other people are doing their thing yeah i suppose uh, ale um just because you had sort of gone first um you know what about like some of your first professional gigs because i i remember like when you had um worked with howard on a project yeah that was and great. um you know kind of a, a around that time if there was something before that or uh kind of you know what that sort of led on to i think that was first year of college and i had been doing that for like probably seven or eight months at one point howard one of my uh and ours um former teachers uh asked me if i could help him on a on a project he was working on and it was this um documentary about the uh, normandy landing in 44 and uh it was really nice and it was uh different from the other projects i've uh, been working on uh, since because uh, on that occasion we wrote basically um, a library of of different tracks uh, we knew uh, what the uh, what the documentary was about what but we didn't we hadn't seen any images or any we didn't know anything about it uh, at least at least uh, i didn't and so we had some moods that we had to cover 
and we started uh, writing music for, for those moods. And uh, it was really nice because I uh, ended up uh, in a real dubbing uh, stage in uh, central London. And I, was, like, I was amazed by everything that was happening. And uh, that was my first uh, professional uh, experience. Uh, I had done maybe one or two student films for that. Uh, yeah, that was my first one. I remember being you jealous got, of you uh, at the time, Ale. I was like, oh, man, Ale's getting to do all this cool stuff. What about me? Uh, I'm not sure I <laughs> man, was... I should study with Howard. <laughs> yeah. Howard and the next year, everybody switched towards Howard. Yeah. <laughs> I did one uh, year with Howard, too. It was really, uh, it was really interesting. He's Howard really... was great because... I love, I love Howard. I, I, learned, I mean, Enrico was great as well. I learned a lot with Enrico, but it was such a different thing being in the room with Howard because... You'd sort of sit there and, yeah, I mean, these were lessons where you're expected to bring something, at least yeah. uh, so I saw it, right? You, you bring your week's work and you talk about it. And invariably with Howard, whatever assessment of your music would last 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. and then, an hour and a half later, you'd wake up having talked about any anything and everything yeah, out of a philosophical I, dream. Yeah, <laughs> it, was a philosophy, it was a philosophy lesson. I, I mean, I had both yeah. Howard and Enrica, and they were yeah. the perfect combination. Guys, yeah, did, did we all have? Did we all have Enrica and then Howard? You had Joe, didn't you, um, Shane? Yeah, Joe yeah. and then Vasco. Good on ah. Joe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. Enrica was super good and super technical. She knew everything. Oh, she still is. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> massive, so massive, massive shout out to Enrica Chandrone and Howard Davidson. <laughs> such a long time ago for us. She, she knows so much about sequencing. She knows so much about orchestration. She helped me so. I mean, she helped me a lot with uh, with the live performance of uh, the piece that uh, the orchestra at RCM played on the second year. Um, so that was useful um, in terms of like practicality. Uh, because I didn't know anything about that stuff. Uh, but with Howard, it was like my kind of vibe, you know, that you can talk about stuff and you can, uh, I don't know, it was kind of therapy, basically. Maybe I need therapy. <laughs> <laughs> you're, right. you're right. It was it was like that, but that's in many ways as important, right? But yeah. I think what, I, what... I have to say, uh, Enrique gave me quite a few therapy sessions <laughs> as well. Yeah, <laughs> so I, 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 I think I needed more therapy in the first year. <laughs> yeah. One thing, one thing I think worth mentioning as well, because we're all sort of, um, you know, uh, swooning over our <laughs> the education part of it. But there's a lot of it where you know we all learn on the job as well. And, <laughs> oh yeah, know, yeah. Obviously, I mean, Michael, you know, I was about to say that's, that's we're how I learn. Here. I, that, that one, the the first professional job was given to me from Mike through Shane. Obviously, I didn't know Shane at that point. Uh, that was your first but, job. Yeah, that was that was my first job, and I had no. <laughs> Shane didn't. Uh, the thing is, the thing is, who, the thing is, who thought who who decided that hiring you was a good idea? Mike and Shane, what were you thinking? <laughs> the thing is, like we were, you know, I, I, we had to get it done. That's what we were thinking. I was just, yeah. I was just as surprised as you were, but you know, it was a very quick learning curve. So when when was this? Like, if I can ask, guys, because I didn't know this it thing. Was two years ago, yeah, yeah. yeah. just about yeah. Mission Impossible. Three. Three, yeah, it was yeah. the Mission Impossible oh, project. Mission, uh, so, uh, so I didn't know you were on Mission Impossible. Oh. Yeah. three years ago now, guys. I think no. So no, you it was joined 2017, two. two and a half, I think. And it, yeah. I I was gonna say that I uh, so no, it's last no, it was year. 2018, guys. Sorry. It was two years yeah. ago at this time. Yeah, it was 2018 because 2017 was my first year of college and Mission okay. Impossible was second year of college. Um, mm -hmm. I was going to say that um, I, I I was thinking recently about this fact. So this year when I have been working for uh, with you guys and for you guys, uh, Shane particularly, I like I, I think back since like this sort of, you know, academic year, uh, even though I'm not in, in college anymore, but like this sort of ac academic year has has ended and it's been one year since my graduation i was thinking back to this year and to the things that have happened and i realized that like the, the curve and the learning that i've had this year on the fields like working uh along with you guys has been uh extremely positive like i i feel i, I i've gained a lot both as a person and as a composer um 
and uh, and and yeah like definitely learning on the field is a huge part of it because there were things that uh, I that I've developed and that I've realized oh, oh this works in this way and oh I'm supposed to do this this other way um that's like, that's for every every job though like, yeah but I it, think it changes your perspective completely on like it, it, so this is the thing it changes your perspective on on the job and on what you're supposed to do and where you stand in your business like I had an idea of what I was gonna end up doing when I when I came out of college and in, and it, it's changed during the course of this year just because of, of like what happened and, and like the works that we've done together and all that stuff so mm -hmm. it's, it's, well, I think that's a key really important thing is to be very adaptable and to be constantly sort of reevaluating things as well just because it's a very fluid industry mm -hmm. um, and to be able to have that sort of reflective part of your day or a year to be able to look back and act actively sort of change your path is a very important thing yeah. Um, because then you don't get too far down one path and realize it's not what you wanted to do and it's not what you could potentially do. So I think, I think also, just... like this, the situations change, the technology changes, the methods mm -hmm. change. You yeah. have to just constantly learn new things. Things that yeah. I know now probably will be obsolete in a couple of years and I'll have when, to learn the next thing. <laughs> when orchestration from the technical side becomes an obsolete... Uh... Yeah. <laughs> When, yeah. Dorico, yeah. When, when we're, Dorico when we're, gets too good. When, well, MIDI, when MIDI transcription, uh, let's not use the O word uh, yeah. for that. But it's, um, yeah, I, I think it's interesting to the um, kind of just thinking in kind of like, you know, college versus the field. I think, you know, it's not really one or the other or against the other. Because the things that we learned in college, like how to produce each other and how to do recording sessions, I mean, I remember like Andre and I did like probably over 20 something recording sessions while we were in college. Like, yeah, we, there weren't any slots left for us, Mike. Yeah, well, sorry, but <laughs> early bird. <laughs> sorry, no, and, sorry. Um, so it, it was, you know, like all of that stuff that when we actually got working, like, you know, by the time I got to like a big session in air, it actually wasn't like really anything to worry about because like I've done this a hundred times. It's just a different studio and, you know, the players get it a bit quicker. And, uh, you know, it was, but the, like, I think what I learned a lot in the kind of field was more about the environment of film music. Like it wasn't how to do the job. It's not how to write and how to produce and kind of do it. Like all of us were good at that by the time we came out of college anyway. It was more like, oh, this is sort of like how my music gets picked. Or, you know, like I see the relationship of how, you know, like it didn't matter whether this was a good idea or a bad idea. The director just needed their hand held either way, you know, and kind of seeing like something sold in real time in a, you know, spotting session or in a music review. I think those are the things that you learn kind of in the field that are really like, so um, situational that, you know, you can't really, uh, you could write an encyclopedia of instances, but it's kind of like, those are the things that you sort of have to learn on your own because it relates to like how you, you know, interpret it yeah. or, or what it means to you. I'll, 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 I'll add on top of this though, that like, this is really true. I feel as in the role of, of a composer, um, in the role of a, music department uh worker employee i would say that, like the feeling was also when i came out of college i felt i had a lot of skills uh, like i knew how to do this and that and that other thing then like working in the music department of of a big production and 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 for people who have been doing this for way longer than you it's kind of like tying together all these skills like knowing how to work with sibelius knowing how to go from the midi to uh, to the Sibelius uh, orchestrated file and knowing how to chop MIDI and clean MIDI and blah, 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 and knowing how to orchestrate. You, you it's sort of like you bring a lot of skills that you develop together and you see how they're relevant and why they're relevant in the industry. And you see how people that have been doing this for... I remember like the first time, Shane, that I came over to, to you and we were chatting about like orchestration and stuff. I was completely blown away by how fast... You, I'm, I'm still like... I still struggle to believe... Here, guys, I'll show you. <laughs> yeah. Do you remember Ale? It was me and Ale together. Yeah. And like, oh yeah, you should do this. <laughs> like, oh please, man, slow down. Like, I can't. I, I couldn't physically follow you. And it, it's very. So cool you're telling to say, me like, I'm a bad teacher. <laughs> no, I'm, yeah, <laughs> I'm I'm not, that's, that's, that's partly. 
that's partly from sharing the sort of the ninja lessons, wasn't it, guys? I remember we had one. Uh, I'm pretty sure Shane and Mike were there. Ali, I don't know if you were, but like we we had like a a little nerd out session in in college where we like we're exchanging plugins that we didn't know and <laughs> things like that. Like, how have you been orchestrating without filters? Oh yeah, you know, I remember, no filters. I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> Like months later, AJ was like, "Dude, filters! It still blows." Up. <laughs> but this this plugin learning thing never stops because they're yeah. constantly being created, and every yeah. the protocol and the pro well, the protocol of what you're doing changes from project to project depending on the needs of the the composer. But the the speeding up of your own process that you you never stop improving that. And Can you I know, say- I think back to assisting and orchestrating while still in college and fresh out of college. And I was, you know, it's like chalk and cheese. I'm a different, different person. I wanted to say two um, things. One, one which is going to make Ale, which is related to this, and is going to make Ale very happy. Do you know, guys, what, is been, what has been my source of, of learning, my, my biggest source of learning lately in terms of like cool plugins, how to use them and how to integrate them in a creative way in your work? I can already process. tell what's coming and it's going to yeah, make you, Ale you know not happy coming, whatsoever. <laughs> I've like Jacob Collier has some really cool videos on YouTube where he breaks <laughs> down his logic sessions and how he, he how he yeah. mixes and negative honestly, harmony. Honestly, no, 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 no. Like this is like mainly on on plugin and, and mixing. Like, but I, I've been learning a lot on like cool plugins and how to integrate them. It's like very, very cool. You well, don't like can him? I, can it? I just can I just clarify <laughs> that I, it's I like the guy as a musician. I think he's a genius. Okay. I, mean, I just mentioned once that <laughs> talking about having 57% swing <laughs> on something instead of 60% of swing. <laughs> on something. You, talk, you talked about that one and difference. we never dropped it. We never <laughs> dropped it. Doesn't make that much of a difference. <laughs> <laughs> one, uh, one last I'm thing. Sure it, thing. I'm sure it does to him. I mean, I don't have uh, such a, uh, an ear. I was about to say, <laughs> Ali, if, if you can't tell the difference between that 3%, you have a much bigger problem. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, there, there was a real you know amazing thing. What? If you don't got that 57% swing. <laughs> yeah. You ain't got that 50% swing. Like You don't know a thing if you ain't got that 50% swing. Um, guys, there was a really cool question on, 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 on Twitch, but I think... Danos asked us um, how do how, how would we take inspiration to write a soundtrack and uh, um, oh, and how does it work? Which is I feel like uh, that's it. That's a whole. Video. And I was I gonna say I was gonna, I was gonna say I was gonna say since we're sort of coming to to close to, to end, a cl- yeah. we're coming close to a close. Um, we but could start uh, with that next time. Yeah, yeah. What, and next time, so I wanted to say this, next time, if I'm correct, we are going to be talking about composition process and uh, working with a digital audio workstation and uh, as opposed to writing music uh, with a pen and paper approach or on C. Bailey's. But down the line, there's going to be a, a, um, a whole conversation on where we take inspiration, what other disciplines uh, we are into. I think we were discussing about this. So... Uh, Dan, also, unfortunately, I don't think we can open up a big discussion on this, but please keep coming uh, next Wednesday and in the next uh, few uh, live from the booth sessions because we're definitely going to address this. And it's a very, very interesting question. I feel we composers don't talk enough with each other on like how to get inspiration. And it's such a vast answer and 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 well, and, and just and, on that, V, you kind of touched on something there because we kind of we've talked a lot about um, our our training in film those that have it but we aren't just filmy people necessarily and a lot of us have background in concert writing in pen and paper so that is very much a conversation we want to have with everybody mm. is to talk about you know yes we've we've used DAWs and we've orchestrated from that and whatever and written music in them but you know <laughs> there's also other approaches and and they're all mutually beneficial i think is perhaps mm-hmm. the best way of putting it so yeah, we definitely want to <laughs> want to talk about that next time. Yeah. If you if you if you heard some screams and yells, I apologize. I don't know what's going on in my garden. There's people yelling. There's sheep <laughs> bleating out my window. I'm surprised <laughs> you can't hear that. Yeah. Uh, I apologize. Anyway, we wouldn't um, have known if you didn't mention. But <laughs> cool, <laughs> great. <laughs> You're be it just adds to second. the whole texture. It helps us to imagine. So- yeah, exactly. I mean, it's Italy, so people normally just shout in their gardens, you know, <laughs> in in the middle of the night. 
<laughs> cool. Um, so, guys, what do you I, think? Shall we? I shall we? we start, uh, wrapping it up. Let's yeah. save some. We, we save some of all this. Even wanting more. But <laughs> for, for on, whoever but... for whoever is watching us and may be interested, can we already say that next week we're gonna be, as I was mentioning, on composition yeah. with the digital audio workstation, Logic Cubase, and stuff like that, composing with MIDI, or for the fans of the John William approach, using pen and paper and notation. And, and we could also start answering the last, and, last and or both, yeah. Yeah. We could also start answering the last question. So. For sure. Yeah. 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 I think cool. it's definitely part of that, yeah. Cool guys. Cool. Okay. Well done. Well nice. thank you. Thank you for, to everyone who connected and, and, and commented and watched us. Uh, and uh, we hope to see you guys next week. And please keep coming back, keep commenting, because I think the, the most in, the most interesting part of all this uh, hour and a half long conversation has been sort of, at least for me, engaging with with people and and uh, and, and sharing our experiences. So please, by all means, keep keep joining us. Yeah, please do. Good. Cool. All right, guys. See you next week. Oh, bye bye. Bye bye. bye.